wanted to say something brilliant. I didn't really have anything, and then I said, in there, I said, uh, maybe Ainsley, because she's done and gone to college. <laughs> and she said, no, she'll just toss it back at him. So I'm not going to say anything brilliant. But anyway, we are having a semi semi-annual meeting next, or this coming Wednesday, the 20, is that this Wednesday? Next Wednesday. Next Wednesday, next Wednesday the 21st at 6.30 in the evening. All are welcome to attend, and we especially encourage all members to come out for that. And if you are new to Linden Bible Church, we want to make you aware of some resources available to you. We have a library located to the left of the sanctuary with over 2,000 books as well as DVDs and CDs. We go by the honor system, so you are welcome to check things out yourself, and please return them in a reasonable amount of time so others can enjoy them. We are really excited about the baptism service coming up on July 30th. If you have never been baptized as a believer in Christ and would like to do so, please see Pastor Joel Orfred. Our next song starts off the worship set with reckless love. <clears throat> it says, before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Please stand as we sing.
Good morning. It's so good to see everyone here. And I'm grateful to have an opportunity to tell you about my recent trip to Guatemala. And a uh, pastor was gracious to let me, let me uh, start today. <laughs> and uh, with that in mind, pastor, you know, I have many words to say. So, you know, just. <laughs> um, so yes, so recently I went to, um, it was the end of April, uh, uh, many of you were gracious to send me on my way with a team of about uh, 16 of us from Lindenville area and uh, local people, the oldest being 81 years old and the youngest being 16 and never flown an airplane. And, uh, and I see some faces here that uh, ha are familiar with uh, the, the children's home that we went to. So please enjoy as we walk through the, this journey. First, I want to uh, surprise you with a photo that, yes, indeed, Elvis is alive. <laughs> this young man is named Elvis, and I got to meet him in uh, Antigua at the um, market of many little shops. Um, picture looks a little skewed. Uh oh, that's just that TV, okay. <laughs> um, but uh, it was, he, he was a lovely young man, helped me in uh, finding some wares, and we were, did some bargaining. But also, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, and I want to show you, I'm not one of lots of lots of words, um, but I want to show you the next photo. This, is our, this was an opportunity I had to go into the school of the children's home, and um, and sit in on a classroom. And here you see the, um, these girls, these six young ladies, they were in a science class and had a presentation to make. The presentation of uh, uh, posters are behind us on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the wall there. And look at their faces, look at their temperaments. These young ladies from from the local area there within a radius of about three hours um, are from a variety of backgrounds. The reason the children come to the home is because they have been abused. There has been uh, over an abundance of sexual abuse. Perhaps they've been trafficked. Um, the, the, they may have been uh, domestic um, violence, um, incest, and it was put a burden on too many people, but in the beginning there was two teachers, uh, 1999, that had a burden about Guatemala and the, the trafficked girls and, and children, not just girls, uh, the trafficked children um, in uh, that area of Guatemala City. And uh, one of the ladies was from Vermont. And so Vermont holds a special, special place in their heart there at Monjas. Um, and so it's been running for quite some time. Uh, they ran out of room in Guatemala City and was able to um, acquire land in Monjas, which is three hours away from Guatemala City. And they were, they were practically given nine acres with walls and a gate um, and some protection. And so then began um, the provisions of the Lord in providing teams to go down to help. Um, so teams like ours, we go down, we do projects, we help them um, with painting or building or whatever construction they may need. Um, they have grown to 110 children um, in 10 homes. Uh, one home, the most recent home, was their Casa Maria. And Casa Maria is a home for pregnant teens. And the story, the, the girls that we met and you'll see pictures later, as I have a slew of pictures for you, you'll see a um, 12-year-old girl with a pregnant belly from her father. And her sister, older sister, also there in the home, pregnant, same situation. So, so um, our team uh, focused really on um, painting the kitchen um, they have a, a nice big, big multi-purpose room 
building that we were able to do some painting. Um, but we noticed as we walked around that they didn't have um, uh, the comforts of for, the, for these um, pregnant teens, uh, rocking chairs for their babies, um, for, you know, to, to be able to rock them to sleep. So we were able to go running around finding where in the world would you find rocking chairs that are not wooden um, because they could be eaten by bugs, the wood, right? So um, we were able to, to do that and the team was able to purchase several rocking chairs for, for the homes. So there are 10 homes, uh, house parents, and the house parents are set up to have 12 students in each home and the house parents have their own children with them. So they're raising them uh, very much like similar um, um, uh, ministry that we're familiar with here, um, the fold um, and uh, home settings and uh, structure and so forth for, to, help, to help them. Um, so next picture, please. Uh, one of the highlights for me was to be, uh, my, my role on the team was to be a part of um, helping with Vacation Bible School. Um, and this is in preparation for one of our stories about the lost sheep. Next picture, please. Um, this gentleman was, uh, oh, you forgot that one. That one, yes. Um, the shepherd. Um, this, this gentleman had been on several teams before. He's from New York. And, and joined us uh, in uh, the airport as we were flying over to Guatemala. Um, but he was our shepherd and we had fun crawling around on our hands and knees, bawling like sheep, um, to, uh, to help convey the story uh, that God is really after their hearts. These children who come to the, the home, are, are uh, it, the government is allowing that. The government takes them out of their home and if it's a desperate situation and, and puts them. So it's the government of Guatemala there that, that says, yes, go, or they also yank them out. No, we found somebody that you can be with, so here, come out. But sometimes the family that they, they put them with is just as bad as the original family. So, so, and also these children never know in advance when that in and out is taking place. And so the, the, the really important thing is for the communication of the love of God and the, and, and the value of who they are, that truly that God is the father, the father's heart is seeking their heart, that lost sheep and helping them come and enjoy the, the enjoy the Lord. Um, next picture, please. Um, this is one of the stops that we were able to make as a team to one in a million. There really is very few uh, homes like this in, in a very large radius and this is a nursing home. It is a building, just, just walls, um, so probably like the size of our sanctuary, um, with one wall down the middle, girls on one side, boys on the other, and that's it, beds and their belongings under their bed. It is very, very sad. The elderly are, are truly treated like nothing. So it was a value to me to be able to go, and we, we, I could not keep my hands off of the elderly. We pulled them out of their, out of their rooms and out of the building and they had this little hut that we gathered and we gave them snacks and we sang songs and we were, did silly things just like we would at a vacation Bible school, right? So I was right up my alley being silly and waving my hands and, and hugging and loving on these, these elderly people. Um, next photo, please. The other program that they have um, as an umbrella uh, to this project is Redeemed Women. Redeemed Women is a program for, for widows, widows of all ages. Um, the youngest widow that we saw was 19 years old and she had two children, um, but, the, but this project um, was helping her go through school, finish her schooling so that she could be one of two things, which is very popular for women. Surprise this, a police officer or a nurse, right? Um, very interesting to be a police officer, that's a common thing. Um, but she was so excited and she was doing extremely well. Um, and uh, our pleasure was, you can see the basket of food in front of, the, of us there, standing there. Um, we were able to go into Mount House Market and had a list of, of staples that were possible to buy and we just did the buying 
and filled those up and then were able to deliver them. So no basket was the same. It was just one of those, those fun God things. And uh, the next photo, please. Um, my other joy was to, uh, we had two vacation Bible schools um, to, um, to provide. This one was for a, a remote church. The, the project likes to reach out to churches to find not only to support, but also to gain awareness and that perhaps would take children for them to care for them if they could place children in families, right? So this, was, this church was very close to the border of El Salvador. Um, so we had to travel quite some distance to get there. And, um, but my joy was to be able to share uh, the story of the wedding banquet. We, we have brothers and sisters all across the globe that we will get to meet and greet and fellowship with and be in the presence of the Lord together. And so that was the joy of being able to share that and a fun, silly song, an old song that, that goes along with the passage. Uh, no, no, I cannot go because I have all these busy things I have to do. No, no, I cannot go, right? And so we were ensuring the children to make sure that they say, yes, go, and be a part of, of, of um, the Lord's family. So um, the rest of my words will be in a series, a gallery of photos, um, and... I just briefly want to say the, the, that uh, Guatemala, Monjas is the name of the town. It's um, perhaps like a town like Lindenville it, with Guatemala City being as far away as maybe Burlington, right? Maybe a little bit further, further away than Burlington. Uh, maybe even, no, yeah, probably like Montreal. Guatemala City is kind of like Montreal. And then Monjas would be like coming here, a small town. Um, the uh, opposite of us, their hills, they do have lots of hills and valleys. Their hills are all terraced because, yes, people want to go to the hills. Not really. That's the poor families. The poor families go to the hills. Opposite of us, the rich families are in the hills hiding, right? Um, but the, the poor families go to the hills because they're pushed out of society. They're pushed out of, of land and they're the ones that are walking this way because they have to walk up and, and farm and till all of those terraced hills. So you see lots of terraced hills in the, in the farmlands. But the project is named James Project after James 127, where it says, religion that, our, that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Started as a, as a children's home called the Shadow of His Wings. They've added Brighter Futures, which is an education program. They have their school on campus. They have a preschool through junior high. Um, and then they also sponsor off campus for those that can continue their education. So some, some children they see on a longer basis and some they see maybe only in months. And sometimes they get children delivered to their door because they've just been born and they don't want them. And in that case, those are the only children that can be adopted from the children's home, right? And in the past six years, there has been five of those young people. Um, then they have the Redeemed Women's Ministry Program, the Widows Education Job Training and Startup Business. Um, all of these uh, you could sponsor as a team person. Um, you could sponsor and help, that, help them move along in that way. They have community church engagement program, family preservation program, and a self-sustainability. They were told when they bought this, um, yes, go ahead, with all of these, the gallery. They were told that when, when they bought this property, they would not be able to grow anything. But in nine acres, they have at least 30 variety of, of, of items um, from pineapple to papaya to, to uh, corn to um, uh, uh, they have a little hothouse for lettuce. Um, uh, they had a pond that kept drying up and the fish going away, 
but then there was teams that helped to make um, a tub so that they have been able to successfully raise tilapia and from they know the system now they've done it for years they know how to take them from from the from babies all the way through and to service the table for 150 people right and they've done this for years now uh, when uh, COVID hit it, it, it hurt them just as much as everybody else, but they've been able to be creative, the Lord providing uh, opportunities for the young people that have interest in agriculture and learn the system. They, they were asking for, um, uh, for lemon trees, and so our team was able to purchase about 50 lemon trees for them so that they could plant. In the, and what they can't use, then they can take to the market and sell and they had an abundance of, of avocados in their avocado trees, beautiful avocados hanging off the trees. Um, their coffee, I came back with a little bit. You, it's precious stuff, so you can only come back with a little bit. Um, but they have coffee beans right there. They have, you know, just the people were able to, to um, just stand in awe of all the different things that they had there. So enjoy the, the gallery. Thank you so much for supporting me in, in going. Um, it was a blessing. They are going again in um, February of next year, if you're interested in, in going again. And sometimes there are other teams from other churches in Vermont that end up going, so you could go twice a year, potentially. So enjoy the gallery. Before the end of the gallery, I did need to say about one of the pictures of, the, of a young woman who was there as a child, um, went out of the, the program, um, struggled with life, um, two kids out of wedlock. The Lord got a hold of her heart, um, and she came back to the, to the program, um, and they helped her get education. She is now a lawyer, and she is back with the program, and she is the, the lawyer advocate um, fighting for these children um, before and after they leave the program. So some wonderful, wonderful stories. The other, other blessings of being a part of a team going down is that the team ends up melding and interacting and being in beautiful fellowship with one another, challenging us from being just content with where we are to, um, to, to really look past our routines Yep, a kitchen, typical kitchen. Um, so, so many, so many wonderful connections and fellowship. Uh, two of our men that, that came with their wives on the trip were reluctant in coming. Um, just they, their wives are bringing them. They were boohooing and just in awe of of the the lives that were being um, hurt and mangled and and just fell in love with these um, pregnant women and their situations and wanting their father's heart came out in full force and uh, surprised by one of the kids they didn't really interact with that was just crying boo-hoo, boo-hoo, boo-hoo when, when, we when we were in our uh, last day there. Just the, the effects. So if you do get a chance to, to go anywhere, please consider going to Guatemala.
thank you, Holly, for sharing with us and uh, being willing to serve. And it's uh, just great to see what the Lord's doing and uh, just the things that we can be praying for. Uh, so let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer now. Uh, Lord, we thank you uh, t for today, and we just thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us and how you care for us. Um, we thank you, Lord, that we can gather here today as a body of believers and uh, come to worship you, Lord, and um, just thank you, Lord, for Holly and um, just this trip she was able to go on, Lord, and um, how you're able to use her down there, Lord. And, uh, we just pray, Lord, uh, for these teens and uh, children that have uh, suffered abuse, Lord, just that you would um, work greatly in their lives and uh, bring healing and restoration to them, Lord, and pray for your protection over them. Um, also pray, Lord, for the elderly there, Lord, that have been uh, neglected, Lord. I just pray that you would continue to bring people along, Lord, that would uh, minister to their hearts and uh, show your love to them. And uh, just pray for your continued uh, provision for these ministries down there, Lord, that uh, their needs would be supplied. Um, we also pray, Lord, um, for Connie Sharon, um, who has uh, been hospitalized in the ICU with some breathing issues, Lord. Um, just ask for uh, your protection and healing over her, Lord, and just that you would uh, comfort her while sh she's there and that she would have a quick recovery. Um, also pray for uh, Norman Lovell and Mark Goodwin, Lord, for their um, the health issues that they are facing. And just pray that you would uh, be their strength and their rock and uh, just uh, pray, Lord, for uh, whatever healing you would provide there, Lord, that you would do that, and um, but just especially that you would comfort them and give them peace uh, during these times. Um, we also pray, Lord, for Ukraine, Lord, um, and just the struggles they have faced, and thank you, Lord, um, for, for the reports of how uh, you have used that to draw people to you, um, but we pray, Lord, that um, you would turn back um, those that are attacking them and that they would uh, repent of this evil, Lord, and um, just uh, pray, Lord, for supplies to continue to uh, go out to Ukraine and that you would uh, just help the people there um, and just that you would bring uh, peace to their country again, Lord. Um, and we pray, Lord, uh, for the message now and for Pastor Joel, um, just that you would uh, speak to our hearts and um, that we, we would receive, Lord, the words that you have for us and that we would uh, go forth and uh, live lives that are uh, honoring and glorifying to you, Lord, and that we'd be uh, prepared for this uh, world that we live in and the many challenges we face. And just ask, Lord, that you would uh, give Pastor Joel your words to speak and uh, just ask for your blessing on the rest of the service. In Jesus' name, amen. So we'll uh, allow all those uh, involved in Children's Church to be dismissed. So we have uh, from four-year-old to uh, fourth grade, I believe. Um, <clears throat> it was, uh, as I was looking at those pictures, Holly brought back a lot of memories. Uh, we went there, I was thinking 16 years ago, <laughs> seems like forever. Um, and that picture of the widows and the food you brought her uh, kind of became a, a family story for us as uh, we did the same thing, and, um, and the widow that we brought that food to said, uh, you know, God, God uh, blessed them a hundredfold. <laughs> and we got home, and, uh, and when we came into our house, you know, we knew we had no food or anything there. You know, we'd have to go to the grocery store in the morning, and um, our whole island was filled with food from you folks. <laughs> And, uh, and we were like, you know, blown away. And, um, and then my youngest son remembered, it's what the widow prayed, it's what the widow prayed. <laughs> and uh, so you never know the kind of experiences you have. And uh, praise God for, for you guys and the team and, and all that you were able to do there. Um, well, I'm going to continue probably this Sunday and next Sunday. Next Sunday's uh, Father's Day. And uh, 
We'll, we'll, uh, I'm looking to uh, finish up this series on a beautiful design, uh, God's blueprint for marriage and the family, and uh, focusing in these uh, these few weeks on um, child rearing, child rearing, <laughs> and uh, and today I'd like to speak about Christian training in the home. Uh, uh, two weeks ago. Um, when I uh, did the last sermon on this, I, we talked about a child's responsibility in the home from Ephesians 6, 1 through 4, and concluded with that exhortation in, in uh, Ephesians 6, 4, for fathers, uh, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Um, you know, the big question is, that, that sounds like a great goal, and it is a goal, it's a biblical goal, to bring our children up, to nourish them literally, or rear them tenderly, or nurture them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Uh, but how do we actually go about doing that? Um, you know, that can be a really a daily challenge uh, for parents. Um, I was reminded of that when I read this story this week. A couple with three children waited in line at San Francisco's Pier 41 to purchase tickets for a boat trip to Alcatraz. Um, Others watched with varying degrees of sympathy and irritation as the young children fidgeted, whined, and punched one another. The frazzled parents reprimanded them to no avail. Finally, they reached the ticket window. Five tickets, please, the father said. Two round trip, three one way. <laughs> Sometimes we feel that way as parents. <laughs> you know, it's, it's great to talk about it in theory, but in the reality of life, it can be uh, much more difficult. Um, you know, I, I can, we can remember as parents, uh, and, and I'm sure those of you with young children, um, are questioning how, how, how do we guide these young children, these uh, little ships, all distinctly different, though so, uh, through sometimes turbulent, sometimes perplexing, uh, once in a while gratifying, but always crowded sea of life. Um, you know, as parents, we're faced with a daily onslaught of decisions about what's right or wrong for our children. What are we doing or not doing um, that we should be or shouldn't be? Uh, where do we draw the lines in this area? What responsibilities is this child ready for? And why in the world does this kid act or feel or talk the way they do? <laughs> you know, there's the aggressive one, the shy one, the mean one, the kind one, the sensitive one, and the tough as nails one. And sometimes that's the same one. Uh, the hyper one, the withdrawn one, the one who grunts like an animal, or as one of our children did, thinks she's a dog this month and will only bark. <laughs> I had to laugh this week as that daughter, who now has three dogs and three children, um, the big crisis this week in their family was one of the dogs got really sick and they thought it was going to die, and they took it to the vet, couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, she finally, she's a nurse, and so she's trying to nurse this dog, and uh, she claims that the, the, the thing that turned the corner for the dog was they fed the dog some of my honey. <laughs> so I said, I'm going to use that as an advertising, uh, <laughs> you know, come heal your dog. <laughs> um, you know, it's just, uh, you know, we're juggling a lot, and sometimes parenting can be feel like uh, a zoo. <laughs> and when we add to our child rearing uh, responsibilities as parents, uh, the fact that that never takes place in a vacuum. Uh, often in the merit, in midst of a marriage relationship that is constantly challenging us as well, or even broken. And a relationship with God that is suspiciously like our relationship with our kids. <laughs> and juggling job and ministry responsibilities and really a messy thing called life in general. It's really enough to drive you crazy. <laughs> or hopefully drive you to your knees. <clears throat> no wonder that God said, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Let's face it, we need God's help if we're ever going to attempt such a massive job. 
And fortunately, God has given us some instruction from his word. And this morning, I'd like to look at a few biblical principles, uh, some foundation stones, some markers along the path to guide us along God's path of raising our children. The first principle we need to come to grips with is what is our job as parents? Um, Last Sunday, we spoke about our primary purpose in life being to glorify God and finding our greatest desire in Him, our deepest desire of our heart. And one of the ways we do that, and we mentioned this, is to um, engage in His mission for our lives, uh, namely to make disciples and make that a priority of our lives. And parents, the most important discipleship ministry you will ever have is the discipleship ministry of your own children. A disciple is literally a learner or student, uh, and we are to, to disciple our children to be followers of Jesus just as we are. And you know, there's a basic command when, when Christ called his disciples, and it was pretty simple. Even a child could understand it. Follow me. But that command is huge in its implications. It's follow an unconditional commitment, um, me to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ himself. Um, So in nurturing our children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, um, we have to begin with nurturing them toward a relationship with Jesus. And since salvation is literally a gift from God, uh, praying for our children to come to trust Jesus as their Savior and Lord becomes a primary responsibility for us as parents. You know, I can remember as a dad, um, when we're raising our kids and we're praying all the time for them to come to know Jesus themselves and have a personal relationship with him and You know, our oldest son came to know the Lord and our daughter came to know the Lord, but our third son, he seemed real resistant to that. Um, And his brother and sister were very concerned about him. They were evangelizing him all the time. Um, And uh, and they were telling him, you know, um, you know, if uh, you need to get saved so that when you die, you'll go to heaven. And it finally came out in a conversation one day that his understanding of that was, in order to get saved, I have to die. <laughs> and it was, aha. <laughs> um, and, uh, and he did come to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And, and, uh, and, you know, there was a sense of peace and joy for Christy and I in our lives when that happened. Because we had that sense that it really doesn't matter what else happens in life. Uh, we're going to see them again in heaven, no matter what. <laughs> And, uh, and there was a great peace and a great joy. Uh, and sometimes we had to go back to that and say, it's all going to be good in the end. Um, well, what, um, what really is Christian training? Uh, the nurturing of our children doesn't end when they become followers of Jesus. We continue to train our children in the Lord. And, and what really is Christian training? Um, and I've written a definition, and I'll read it to you. Christian training is loving discipline and instruction designed to teach our children to live wisely by understanding who God is and what our responsibility to him is so they might experience God's blessing and ultimately bring glory to him. So I'll read that again. Christian training is loving discipline and instruction designed to teach our children to live wisely by understanding who God is and what our responsibility to him is so that they might experience God's blessing and bring glory to him. In effect, Christian training is education in godly living. (laughs) Uh, So as parents, we need to understand we're in the education business. (laughs) You know, we had the privilege... uh, this, this week, I, I, I lose track of days, a couple of days ago, I guess it was, <laughs> to go um, and see the eighth grade graduation of three of our LBC students. Um, and um, it was pretty cool that two of them won the music award uh, <laughs> uh, for us here. And uh, you got to hear one of them playing the drums today. <laughs> and 
you know, the principal uh, spoke during, during his speech about the importance of teachers and the impact of teachers in a student's life. And that's true. Um, but immediately I began to think, you know, no one, no one, parents, has a greater impact on your child's life than you do as a parent. Um, we forget that sometimes. Um, as parents, we are our ch- ch- child's ultimate teachers. So don't forget that. You need to hang on to that. And don't let anyone take that responsibility away from you. The nurture and training of our children is a God-given responsibility, not a school or state responsibility or mandate. Don't give up that responsibility to anybody else. Um, Our homes are a training ground, and everything we say and do or fail to say and do is teaching our children. This includes not only our actions and our, and, and our words, but it includes our attitudes, our gestures, our tone of voice, our communication, both verbal and nonverbal, and really the whole atmosphere that's produced in our home. Our children are like little sponges listening and watching, and ultimately, they learn what they see lived out. We used to say in my family, when adults got into adult conversations and there were children present. Remember, little pictures have big ears. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, that they're absorbing, they're listening all the time. Uh, I have a little book, uh, Children's Letters to God, and it's a reminder that they're learning from us about God as well. And uh, these were some actual um, letters from children. Uh, one child asked, how do you know you were God? Charlene. (laughs) Another said, dear God, I read the Bible. What does begat mean? Nobody will tell me. Love, Allison. (laughs) Dear God, is it true my father won't get in heaven if he uses his bowling words in the house? Anita. (laughs) Um, Dear God, I went to this wedding and they kissed right in church. Is that okay? Neil. <laughs> Dear God, is Reverend Coe a friend of yours or you just know him through business? <laughs> Donnie. <laughs> did you really mean do unto others as they do unto you? Because if you did, then I'm going to fix my brother, Darla. <laughs> Here's one. Dear God, thank you for the baby brother, but what I prayed for was a puppy. (laughs) And this one. uh, Dear God, I bet it is very hard for you to love all of everybody in the whole world. There are only four people in our family, and I can never do it. Nan. And dear God, I didn't think orange went with purple until I saw the sunset you made on Tuesday. That was cool, Eugene. (laughs) Our children are taking it in. Our children are listening. Our children are watching, parents. (laughs) And uh, and so that it is incumbent on us that we be role modeling and discipling them. As parents, you know, we can get focused on our responsibilities, and they're great to provide food and clothing and a home for our children and lots of other things. And we can forget in the process that we're in the education and discipleship business. We're not only nourishing their bodies, we're nourishing their minds and their hearts as well. Let me just say a few things about that training process. Training takes time. I'm not sure that I think there's really anything such as quality time. (laughs) You know, we always want that. We want quality time with our children. Um, But, you know, our children just need our time. Um, And unfortunately, we can't schedule teachable moments with our children. We just have to be there. I applaud those of you who are able and can choose to stay at home as stay-at-home moms. Um, you know, that is a sacrifice and, that you will never regret. And I know as we look back, that is something we are so glad that we were able to do. Uh, and not everyone is able to. Uh, and dads, what about your schedule? Are you making it a priority for you to be there with your kids and to be engaged when you are? <laughs> 
Are you leading spiritually in your home with your kids? Are you praying for them, teaching them as you do things together, modeling time in the Word, and teaching them God's Word? Training takes time, and our children need our time as a priority. I will also say that training never stops. Uh, And you know what? As parents, we're the example. (laughs) You know, when we, I remember when we got our first dog and our, our, our neighbor up the street, John, was, was a dog trainer, and, um, and we were having a lot of trouble teaching this dog, you know, <laughs> and he reminded us, you're always training the dog. So it kind of doesn't work if dad has, comes in and tells the dog can't do this and can't be on the furniture and this and that, and then other people in the house <laughs> are letting the dog get away with murder. <laughs> You know what? We're all always training the dog, and we had to learn that. Um, We didn't learn it very well, but we tried. (laughs) You know, there's an importance to consistency with our kids. Um, And our kids, we're always training our children because they're always watching and listening. Um, And the greatest thing, parents, that you can do for your children is to model your own relationship with the Lord. Um, Do they see that you love Jesus more than anything else? And the second greatest thing you can do for your children is to love your spouse. It provides a security and a safety, a place of refuge for them in an atmosphere of love. And what a beautiful thing it is to see dad kissing mom, you know, (laughs) and showing respect and kindness towards each other and insisting on it from the kids as well. Training takes time, training never stops, and training always has to be motivated by love. You know, the motive for godly training is always love. It's an assurance of a son and a daughter relationship to parents. And the Bible makes clear that a failure to discipline is a failure of love. Um, Proverbs 3, 11 and 12, and I think we have that, those verses, um, uh, says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. Next. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father the son in whom he delights. You know, that tells us that the Lord's discipline, like our discipline of our children, is out of love. Um, and then Hebrews 12, 5 through 11 speaks again of, of the Lord's discipline and compares it to ours and, and says, And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when you are reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves. You catch that? The Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For a moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. What a great statement on God's discipline mirroring, and, and our discipline as parents mirroring God's discipline and for the same reasons. In Proverbs uh, thirteen twenty four, do we have that one? Yeah, whoever spares the rod hates his son, uh, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. We'll talk a little bit more about those ideas of uh, discipline in in the book of Proverbs. But there there are two books in the Bible that have a lot to say about training our children, and they are the book of Proverbs and the book of Deuteronomy. Um... And one of the things they teach us is the goal of of Christian training. 
Now it's interesting, the book of Proverbs is a father's instruction manual in wise living to his son. In fact, I was noticing that in the first seven chapters, uh, after an introductory purpose statement, each of the first seven chapters of Proverbs begins with an appeal, my son or my sons. And in fact, that is repeated 17 times in those first seven, in those first seven chapters. Uh, so this is a father appealing to his son. My son, do this. My son, uh, you know, do that. My, you know, giving him godly encouragement. And I'd encourage you parents, you know, if you, wanna, if you want a biblical uh, study on, on, on raising children, do a word study on discipline and instruction in the book of Proverbs. And uh, for extra credit, you can add correction, reproof, rebuke, and the rod. <laughs> but two, two closely related words in the book of Proverbs are um, yasar and musar, or Hebrew words, and they're used 35 times in the book of Proverbs. They, they are, are defined as discipline, correction, sometimes admonishing, and at times even chastening. Um, They have the idea of correction that results in education. Isn't that interesting? Um, And so parents, I want to remind us, our children need correction. Unlike modern philosophies of childhood that teach that our children are all inherently good, um, they are not inherently good. Our children, like all of us, are born with a sin nature, a bent toward selfishness, that needs to be corrected through godly training. And Proverbs teaches us that the purpose of Christian training or discipline is, to, is for our children to learn to live wisely. Solomon says right at the beginning of Proverbs, his purpose was to teach his son wisdom and instruction. There's that Hebrew word again. And in one three to receive instruction. There it is again, in wise living. And in 19.20, he advises, listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. And so what is the, at the heart of wise living that Solomon is promoting in the book of Proverbs? Um, how do we go about teaching our children to be wise? Well, I believe according to Scripture, there are two basic components. First, we must teach our children who God is. And secondly, what our responsibility to him is. It's interesting that in the music we sang this morning, we we sang, this is who you are. We're talking about who God is. We're teaching ourselves, even through music, who our God is, what kind of God we have. Um, And then we, we are faced with the responsibility is, therefore, on that basis, what's our responsibility to him? Ultimately, to bring glory to him. Um... In the book of Deuteronomy, which means the second telling of the law, Moses is on the other side of the Jordan just because just before they're about to enter the promised land, and he's speaking to the Israelites to prepare them. In fact, the whole book of Deuteronomy is a long sermon, so you think mine are long. (laughs) Um, And uh, and he says in Deuteronomy 4:35, to you it was shown that you may know that the Lord is God; there is no other beside Him. He's telling them to remember how God appeared to them on Mount Sinai and all the miracles he did to bring them out of Egypt and and bring them through the wilderness. And he says, God showed you all of those things so that you could know something. So you could know the Lord, Yahweh, is God. And there's no one other besides him. And then he goes on to say in the famous passage in in Deuteronomy 6, the the Shema, as as the Jewish people call it, Hear, O Israel. The Lord, Yahweh, our God, and the Lord is one. The the Lord is our God, and the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your souls, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. Sounds like teachable moments, doesn't it? You know, we're always teaching our children. And he's saying our primary responsibility as parents is to teach our children to love God with every part of their being. And let's do that day and night in all of the the events of life that we go through. You know, there's a story in Scripture 
Um, that's a great tragedy, and it's the story of uh, Sam, uh, in First Samuel of Eli and his sons. Eli was a high priest, and you know, responsible. He, he was the high priest of Israel, and and um, but he had he had two very disobedient sons. Uh, in fact, it says about them in First Samuel two twelve that his sons didn't know God. Um, and he failed to discipline them. Uh, he gave them, you know, a kind of weak rebuke, but he never took action. And they were doing horrible things uh, as, as, as priests of God. And, and God took their life as a result of that. Um, you know, his, his life as a parent is he failed to teach his children to know God, though, though he was the high priest of Israel. Um, and to discipline them. Parents and potential parents, and maybe we can even throw in grandparents, who or what is our God? Um, Are we glorifying God, as we said last week, by making Him the number one priority of our life, our time, our energy, our money, our talents? And is knowing Jesus Christ the greatest desire of our hearts? Your children will know what's really important to you. It's hard to fool your kids because they live with you every day. (laughs) Um, What are they seeing and what are they hearing? And when push comes to shove, what are the priorities of your time and your family? I can tell you after 32 years of ministry, my observation is that parents who have a half-hearted devotion to Christ um, will probably raise children who um, know that and ditch the whole thing uh, and maybe not even be, be willing to be believers. Um, our kids are often less committed to Christ than we are. They know it wasn't that important to their parents, so they just ditch the whole thing and they live for whatever priority their parents had or or they live for themselves so I want to challenge you will your kids be able to look back one day and say well there's one thing I know about my mom and dad that my mom and dad love Jesus Christ and put him first in their life will they know that no matter where they go or what they do that their mom or their dad or their grandparent is praying for them Remember, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working, James says. You know, one of the the great blessings of my life was to have um, Christian parents who brought us up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. They weren't perfect, Um, but but they did did train us to know and love Jesus. Um, Six kids. (laughs) And, uh, you know, as as we got older... um, you know, and got out on our own, uh, we always knew that every single day of our lives, my par- our parents were praying for every single one of us and our kids. <laughs> they had long lists. <laughs> um, and the joke in the family was if, um, if, you know, you got prayed for every day, but if, if you were kind of in trouble, um, you probably got prayed for two times. And if things were really bad, you got three or more times in a day. Um, but we knew they were laboring in prayer for us. And I can tell you as a son, when days got really dark and, uh, and you know, everything was looking down, sometimes the encouragement of my life was, I know mom and dad prayed for me today. And that gave me hope that God was going to see me through. Um, what a testimony. Wouldn't that be great for that to be the testimony of our lives, you know, that I know my mom and dad are praying for me today. I know my grandma and grandpa are praying for me today. And I I know they're not going to give up. And I know they're going to pray me through this. And uh, we're challenged to to try and copy that example. Well, what is this responsibility to um, this instruction that um, God calls on us to give to our parents include? Um, I'll give you a little trailer for next week. Uh, The instruction of love, the instruction of fear, a fear of God, and the instruction of obedience, among other things. Uh, So let's pray. 
Father, we thank you that we can call you Father. We thank you that you loved us enough to send your Son to die on the cross for our sins. Thank you that you have modeled for us what it means to be a good Father who loves us, who instructs us, and who disciplines us. I want to pray for our parents and our grandparents here today, Lord, just that um, that you will enable them, encourage them, challenge them, and help them to raise their children in a way that, um, that honors you and glorifies you. God, we, we don't know how to do it. <laughs> um, we need help every day. And so I just want to lift up our, our parents to you, and I want to lift up our children to you, Lord. You have blessed us in this church with lots of children, and, um, and I want to pray for them today. Lord, I want to pray that you would, you would speak into their hearts, that you would draw them to yourself. I want to pray, Lord, that you would, you would help us to be able to help these parents to, to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, the nurture and discipline and instruction of the Lord. And uh, give us the courage to be the parents that you've called us to be. And help us to put the priorities in place uh, in our own lives to model that to our kids. We commit them to you and we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So please stand and sing with us, Stand in Your Love. We're going to let Joe start. Fred, oh, here comes Fred. Okay, we weren't sure. He was in children's church, so we weren't sure if we have him or not. Yeah. 